Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome once again to our weekly COVID-19 public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Vigili, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and as usual, Dr. Travis Gales, our health officer, is joining us. Also, Dr. Earl Stoddard, who is the Director of the Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. And today, we have two additional guests, Dr. Raymond Kroll, who is the Director of the Department of Health and Human Services, and Chief Administrative Officer, Rich Maddalino, who is here and will be available to answer any questions related to the budget that reporters might have. Reporters, you should all have permission to record already. If you do not, please use the chat to request it. And later on, also use the chat for the portion of the Q&A of this presentation. With that, I toss it to you, Mr. Crown Executive. So thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us on our weekly, weekly press briefing. I'll start as I usually do. Uh, with where we are with COVID. Uh, today we find our positivity rate at 0.86 and our case rate is 2.15 per 100,000 residents. Uh, we saw 15 new cases yesterday and we've been below 20 cases per day since the weekend. So obviously this is a really significant improvement. Uh, our population, um, 55.5% of our residents have received both doses of Pfizer, Moderna, or the single dose of J&J, according to CDC data, and 61.6% .6 have now received at least their single dose. Um, this Friday, May 28th, right before Memorial Day, we will be aligned with, with state health uh, regulations. As we mentioned last week, the confusion we're seeing throughout our community is regarding face coverings. So on the screen is a graphic we wanted to share in preparation for Friday about face covering guidance. Um, there will no longer be mandatory mask, um, mandatory masking, however, the state still requires face coverings to be worn on public transportation inside schools, healthcare settings, youth camps, and childcare um, facilities. And the county is gonna continue to require all persons to wear face coverings inside of county owned and operated buildings. The Maryland Department of Health is encouraging all individuals who are older than two and not fully vaccinated to wear face coverings in all public indoor settings and outdoor where physical distancing is not possible, as well as for all people to wear masks indoor and out, indoors and outdoors um, participating in youth-related activities when physical distancing is not possible. Um, this is critical. All private businesses, churches, nonprofits can require face coverings. This is a decision made by the owners of businesses. We understand why they would make that decision. Um, I continue to, when I go into places, to find that most people, once you step inside, are still continuing to be masked. That's probably a good thing. And this is the right of an owner to require that you wear a mask. So if you don't like it, they're actually doing something they have the right to do. Um, arguments over masking can quickly get heated and we need to make sure everybody knows these facts and understands um, the guidance so that there's no question about whether or not an owner is able to do this. Uh, I also wanna thank all our employees throughout so many departments who've been working so hard to get us to this point. Last weekend, I got out with our community outreach team at the H Mart and they were literally escorting people across from the shopping center where the H Mart was over to the FEMA mass vaccination site at Lake Forest Moore Mall. And this morning I found out that our PSAs from Salute Bienestar, our Latino Health Initiative COVID outreach effort, have been nominated for an Emmy for their important work. And that's quite a thing just to be nominated for an Emmy. Uh, we still have thousands of our residents who are not vaccinated, and we remain committed to finding them and encouraging them to be vaccinated. And I encourage all Montgomery County vac residents to get vaccinated in this by this holiday weekend if you are not already. I also want to appreciate the efforts of the state for creating the lottery and hoping that the inducements of the lottery will continue to incentivize people to get vaccinated. We're almost back to normal. Um, but it's still too early for mission to accomplish. That was a bad scene on an aircraft carrier a number of years ago. We're not about to repeat here. Um, 
Memorial Day weekend's coming up. Obviously, things are moving more back to normal, but it's going to be a while before things are completely normal. We're still going to be half, we're still going to be looking at when it's time for booster shots and how variants affect um, vaccines and treatment. So this is far from over in terms of an episode in our lives, but I think we've moved from like the darkest chapters of the episode, at least here. And um, we can look forward to things staying, I hope, uh, more improved in the current state. After every holiday, you know, we've seen an uptick in cases. And this is the first holiday that since we've had a vast increase in vaccinations, and perhaps we won't see the kind of uptick that we've seen in the past. I hope that everyone has a safe weekend and uses some common sense uh, with their own comfort level as they join weekend activities. And as it is Memorial Day weekend, I encourage anyone to take a moment to, to recognize and appreciate the sacrifice of millions of men and women who laid down their lives for our country. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about George Floyd and basically civil rights and the state of affairs where we are right now. Um, this week marks the first anniversary since the murder of George Floyd. This murder sparked the social justice movement of a scope that probably hasn't been seen since the civil rights era of the 60s. Um, I gotta say it's, um, it's especially sad because there were an awful lot of deaths and murders between the 60s and George Floyd's death. And we did not deal with the issue of civil rights in the 60s as we should have. And the legacy of our failure to deal with that continues to haunt us. Uh, next week, May 31st and June 1st, is the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Mass Massacre in Greenwood, Oklahoma. If you subscribe to National Geo, um, that is the cover story in the, mag in the magazine that I got, I guess, yesterday in the mail. It is a horror story. It is just symbolic of the racism that is prevalent in this country. Uh, we're not fortunately at the point of what happened in Tulsa, but there continues to be a lack of civil rights, a lack of economic opportunity, a lack of fundamental justice that is visited on the African-American community to this day. And at some point, this country has to get serious about addressing the inequities that all of us know all too well are out there. Um, and a week ago, I guess a couple weeks ago, I had a great conversation with Harold Fisher on WHUR. And you know, the point I made then was that, you know, George Floyd's not the first black person who was wrongfully killed at the hands of the police. And he has not been the last. Uh, we've had two more killings in Tacoma Park not by a county police officer, but by somebody who worked, I guess, for the State Department um, in a law enforcement position. Uh, so the role of people who get murdered by people who think they have authority uh, continues to go on. We've also had a number of killings, you know, over recent years involving officers and people in mental health crisis that occurred because officers didn't have the training they needed or the tools they needed. And because our one crisis intervention team is simply inadequate to arrive when it's needed. So in this budget, we are adding additional crisis intervention teams to provide more opportunities, keep them dispersed around, around the county so that when people are dealing with people in a mental health crisis, we can help them with more than just a police officer who has very limited tools to deal with a person in crisis. Um, we're hoping that this is the start of making longer term changes. You've heard a lot of us talk that, you know, in, in our world and in pretty much everybody's world in this country, we have dumped an enormous number of the social problems in the police department. They deal with alcoholism, they deal with drug addiction, they deal with homelessness, they deal with mental illness, all things that belong in the realm of social services. But all things that because we don't, not willing to make the investments and pay attention to these issues and recognize them for what they are, they wind up in the hands of the police department. We are going to work <coughs> to shift some of those responsibilities 
out of the police department to more appropriate departments so that the police aren't put in the situation of dealing with what with circumstances that are really not designed to deal with. Um, in this county, I began implementing reimagining public safety policies starting when I got elected. We had a very large town hall. Out of that town hall became a decision uh, to start evaluating what the police department does and to look at you know how they interact with the community. We had money in the budget before the shooting of George Floyd that was meant to fund the study and an evaluation of the department. So we've continued with that. And we are hoping that we will very soon have the analysis and recommendations from that work. And we're gonna begin transforming our policies and practices. We simply can't rely on police for everything. And this upcoming budget is gonna point us in a direction where we actually can do this work in a more cohesive way. Along the same lines, we're working with the school system now to address mental health in the schools um, to provide the kind of support kids need. Um, I am removing the SROs from the schools and we are gonna be working with the schools to determine what kind of mental health supports will go into the schools um, coming in the fall semester. Their report, our report is gonna come back to us on June 15th. It's been a real pleasure working with the school system and having a discussion and a recognition that these problems are neither school problems nor government problems alone. They are everybody's problems and we're working together to try to come up with solutions and how we deal with them. Um, the budget, tomorrow the Montgomery County Council will pass um, the physical 2022 operating and capital budgets, recovering from the pandemic and moving forward our efforts to reimagine public safety, providing more mental health supports and services toward our residents. Uh, the budget moves a number of um, key important th things that were important to us forward. Um, the council's approved 99.85% um, of what we sent over there. And it's actually, I think, a little over $100 smaller than the budget we sent. And they were able to, to, to take 9.4 million that I had to tie to a lease into a contract and when they didn't fund that, that freed up another that freed up another nine million dollars that they were able to spend on things that I would have spent had I had the money. So I've been very supportive of uh, the work they did. I think this is a strong budget. Um, we are still recovering from the pandemic, and I have to thank the federal government and the legislators and the president for their support that has come to Montgomery County that's made us possible for us to recover like so many jurisdictions all around this country that were counting on the election of a federal government that actually recognized that the survival of local governments was kind of important. Um, so their support's been really, really important to us. Uh, the governor continues to put out more support for things like rent relief and business relief. And we had great support from our state legislators over the past um, year. So I, th I felt like everybody in, in that we deal with has been pulling on, a, on the same team. Uh, this, this budget is going to find, you'll find more money for education. You're going to find expanded transit and moving forward on BRT designs. Um, there's money in there for fighting climate change. We've got the final report from the, the group that we commissioned to um, digest the citizen recommendations. Um, that report will be coming out. Um, we've been working on climate change initiatives without that, and we're going to continue to do so, but you'll see more things rolling out faster now. And um, we fully funded the education button budget, again, above maintenance of effort. We did, did this without having to raise the tax rates in Montgomery County. And Again, working with the council, we've addressed a wide, wide range of issues. One of the things I'm really proudest of is uh, we lost our homeless shelter due to uh, environmental um, problems where it was located. We, we are purchasing and renovating a new shelter that will give us greatly increased capacity. And we're looking for additional sites so that we can actually bring to an end the longstanding county policy of having people to sleep outside. Um, for eight months of year. Uh, we are upgrading our existing recycling complex, which has not been able to meet the demands of the recycling, particularly plastics, for 
years, and this is um, going to get an upgrade. We have more money in the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund, and we'll be working with community um, development corporations, institutions to help uh, provide financing for more affordable housing projects. We opened the new linkages to Learning Center at South Lakes Elementary School and Needlesville Middle School, as well as the school based health center at South Lakes Elementary. So this budget has a lot. It really focuses on services for our residents. Um, and I think that uh, people are going to find that we are actually able to make progress. I know at times during COVID, everybody was dreading what this is going to look like uh, going into the budget season. And it turns out that it, um, we survived this pretty well. And we're able to do a lot of things, not simply lick our wounds from the virus, but actually move the ball forward in Montgomery County. And I'm very happy to be able to say that um, this is our last media briefing for the month of May. And since May is also Mental Health Awareness Month, I've asked um, Dr. Raymond Crowell to join us for our briefing today and provide a short um, presentation of our mental health efforts and investments. Besides being the director of Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Kroll is a um, clinical psychologist and psychotherapist, and he has 30 plus years of providing direct clinical services with extensive experiences in counseling, stress management, trauma, and child and adolescent development. Um, we know that, um, that COVID has is, is played a toll with people, had a toll on people's mental health. We know there are studies that are out there now showing that there are actually lingering effects of COVID that have impacted people's mental health and that some of those don't become apparent until some months after a person thinks they are done with COVID. So we, like everybody else, are looking to see what actually materializes and what's that going to require us to do. But in the meantime, we know that COVID certainly enhanced isolation, depression, and stress and substance misuse and domestic violence and child abuse. Uh, COVID made all these situations worse. Um, we've had 108 county residents die of opioid-related overdoses. That's an increase of 26% from 2019. According to NAMI, one in six youth between the age of six and 17 are experiencing mental health disorders each year. There were 10 suicides in the zero to 24 group in 2020 as compared to eight in 2019. And in 2019, 18.8% .8 of youth nationwide seriously considered attempting suicide in 2019. That's, all these numbers are indicative, indicative of the problems that we really do have to address. So um, I will let Dr. Crowell go more into this, but you know, we continue to um, be committed to working on this. We'll be opening our Avery Road Treatment Center. I guess we get a grand opening in the next couple of weeks, our crisis center provides free crisis services, uh, no appointment needed, and our mobile crisis teams will provide emergency crisis evaluations for individuals who are experiencing mental health, health crises. So I think I'll stop there and look forward to hearing from Dr. Kroll. And uh, I guess now we'll turn it over to Dr. Gales and Dr. Stoddard. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Wednesday. I'm happy to report there's not a lot to uh, update uh, from the public health perspective. Uh, the county executive shared with you where we stand in terms of community transmission, as well as uh, the progress we've made in, on the vaccine front. We will continue to encourage any individual who's not been vaccinated to get vaccinated as soon as possible. We have lots of different venues that you can access to, to get that. So please take a look at the county site to see all of the different places where vaccines are available for you uh, so that you get covered. I would like to take uh, this time to highlight and say a special thank you. We've said thank yous throughout the pandemic and there's an infinite list of folks who deserve thanks for all the work that they do. But I wanted to highlight two sets of folks. The first group, uh, given that the, as the county executive mentioned, we are moving forward in terms of aligning uh, on Friday, being in alignment with the state in terms of capacity limits and all those kinds of things. And that uh, those efforts uh, mean that we don't have to do uh, proposals anymore. 
uh, or at least in the short term. And hopefully we won't get back to a place where we have to. So I wanted to specifically say thank you to the policy and proposal team that has been reviewing proposals around reopening since last year. They just on record, they have reviewed over 900 different proposals for different activities. Uh, and that does not include what I'm sure are hundreds of others uh, that were submitted informally through emails uh, in terms of guidance that they provided to folks. Um, so a special thank you to all of the individuals who participated in that process and continue to provide guidance to our residents to keep them safe. And the second group of folks that I'd like to say a special thank you to are the administrative uh, staff uh, within Public Health Services, my own admin team, um, EAA, Stella, Sharif Shakir, uh, Ellen Siegel, and Charlene Hicks, uh, and a host of others, um, and not only within Public Health Services, but also within H HHS who have kept us on time, kept our schedules up to date, uh, and made sure we are where we need to be to make sure that we can provide the resources and feedback to the community, uh, whether it's through setting up meeting times or making sure that all of the numerous contracts that are in place meet the muster uh, from an ethical perspective as well as a legal perspective uh, and create this space for us to be able to move forward. Now, I didn't name everybody individually, but know that you are appreciated and we, we thank you for all the efforts that you have done throughout the pandemic and will continue to do so as we move forward. I will stop there, but happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Thank you, County Executive. Uh, Dr. Stoddard, any opening remarks coming from you? Yeah, just a couple. Um, so uh, a few things we're working on. Uh, so we're obviously collaborating with some uh, behavioral health and psychologists to help us with our COVID-19 messaging, both in our um, uh, public information office, but also with our uh, uh, ethnic uh, health initiatives, our Latino Health Initiative, our African Health, African American Health Partnership, and the Asian American uh, Health Initiative as well have been partnering with uh, psychologists to look at messaging and how the variants of messaging should be applied to the very to various different ethnic groups and targeted parts of the county. So that's been a partnership. We've actually been able to leverage a state grant to, to fund those efforts to expand sort of our, our deep dive into the message development process targeted for those those groups. Um, I've gotten, we've gotten some questions about the Germantown mass vaccination site. We are aware that other mass vaccination sites are ramping down or closing from across the state and other places. At this point, we are we're working very closely with the state on the Germantown site, but we have no date nor any plans for a specific date uh, when that site will close. We're still seeing a pretty good turnout. Uh, obviously, we have second doses ranging from seven to 800 doses a day at that site. And then we, typically we get five to seven or 800 uh, additional walk-ups or scheduled appointments for first doses on a regular basis at this point still. So we still see more than enough volume to, to warrant can keep, keeping the site open. Uh, this, the hours do flex a bit. So we're you know, opening Saturdays and, and evenings one or two days a week as well. And so that will, will continue to be constantly shifting and tweaking that to try and uh, maximize opportunities for residents. But we have no plans at this point to close it. And we will be sure to let you know if we do come to that decision once the volume dictates that we should. Um, as the county executive alluded to, we have teams literally going uh, door to door in various parts of our county to try and encourage people to get vaccinated. In, in the seven most commonly spoken languages, we have volunteers working to make sure that we can contact people in the language that they're comfortable speaking in. And as county executive said, in many cases, we're actually just taking them right to the sites that are operating to get them vaccinated. In other cases, we're helping them schedule appointments or get them locations or get them in to get vaccinated. And we'll continue to do that until we feel, you know, we feel like we've had everyone have uh, direct contact and outreach and an opportunity that's tailored to them to be vaccinated. And so I won't go into some of the other things, but we're working very collaboratively. Uh, Dr. Kroll will speak more about the mental health stuff, I'm sure. But obviously, our opioid intervention team actually met this morning and discussed uh, many of the things the county executive alluded to about the increases we have seen, not just in Montgomery County, but across the state in opioid-related fatalities, in addiction, self-harm, suicide, and, um, you know, um, sort of even alcohol uh, addiction uh, consequences have been seen that there have been COVID related changes to all those things. And so we're working very collaboratively across the county to address them all, both as part of our recovery framework, but transitioning to the to the normal activities that we've been doing in Montgomery County for a number of years that we'll continue to do for years to come. I will stop there. 
Uh, Lorna, if I could just add one more thing before Dr. Kroll goes. Uh, I left out one important name to mention uh, in terms of a special thank you. Uh, Cindy Edwards, who has been our senior administrator for communicable disease and epidemiology for a number of years and has been a senior manager uh, and critical player in the pandemic response uh, over the last year, will be retiring uh, at the beginning of June. And so I just wanted to also add her to the list of a huge thank you uh, for all of her service through the many years of working for the county and particularly providing senior leadership throughout the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Dr. Kral, you have some opening remarks I hear. You need to mute. There you go. I do. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, and uh, I hope this everyone is having a good uh, mental health uh, awareness month. Um, you know, as we come out of this pandemic, you know, it's, it's clear that our recovery uh, is, is, is going, recovery is going to have its own challenges separate from those of the pandemic and the medical pieces of the pandemic. And mental health is one of those, starting quite honestly with reopening. Um, reopening is, is uh, going to cause some anxiety in, in, in people uh, for some very good reasons. As more and more people are vaccinated, the, the tangible things that signal safety from COVID are changing. The guidelines from, from the CDC and our local, our local and state uh, guidelines, mask and physical distance requirements are ending uh, as our limitations on social gatherings, and sports, such as sports events, uh, uh, restaurants and school and religious gatherings. All of the things that were visible signs and signals that we were protecting ourselves and each other are going away. Vaccination has made that possible and safer to do, but it may not feel that way first for, for, for people. So there's a, there's, a, there's a piece of that that we have to pay attention to. More importantly, uh, to Dr. Stoddard's comment, the, the ongoing challenges of, of depression and substance abuse and domestic violence, suicide and overdose are still with us. None of that went away. And in some cases, it's gotten worse during the pandemic. Uh, overdose deaths uh, have increased all across the state by about 19 or 20, 19 percent from, from, from 2019. Uh, and last year, we had a total of 108 county residents that died from opiate overdose or related drug, uh, drug poisoning in 2020. That was 26% more than we had the previous year. Um, suicide rates across the state uh, have, have not risen, except that there is some concern that, that uh, the rates for black residents across the state may be rising. So it's something we're having to keep an eye on and begin to think about how we plan for. Um, and, and of course, anxiety has jumped dramatically with COVID uh, from about 13% of, of people reporting uh, anxiety pre-pandemic to 40% of people reporting some level of anxiety from mild anxiety to severe panic attacks and, and uh, post-traumatic stress. Um, COVID has added all of that to our mental health challenges and, and the, the events of COVID have added to that. Trauma, the trauma of losing lost loved ones, uh, a severe case of COVID-19 in the family, our inability to grieve, uh, the loss of family members and friends as we normally would, loss of jobs, economic security, social isolation, and, the, and, and our children who lost a lot of ground academically as well as, as socially. All of that is going to impact our, our, our mental health recovery from the pandemic. So what the county has been doing is, as, as Dr. Stoddard pointed out, is getting back to our ongoing work, the work that we never stopped doing um, throughout this pandemic, but which played on in the background in, in, uh, of, of COVID testing and vaccination and safety. Our substance abuse programs, our overdose intervention team is ramping back up with the state to begin strategies for increased messaging and outreach and treatment, and, and including implementing some new approaches that we, we had to put on hold because we couldn't be face to face with the public as, as, as much as we would have liked. Uh, our, our, our children, for our children, we're partnering with our providers uh, and with the school system and with behavioral health um, for uh, both to deal with the needs of children as things reopen and as summer school begins, as well as uh, the, the, the initiative that the county executive referenced and that, and that has been funded in the budget to, to change the, the way we bring behavioral health um, into the schools and, and the way we support our children's behavioral health needs in the schools, as well as the way we protect their safety. Uh, things that we're starting to work on now that we'll have in place beginning as, uh, as the fall school year uh, starts. Um, we're anticipating the council, as the council completes its, its budget, its work on the, on the county executive's budget next year, uh, that that 
capacity in MCPS will be expanded to, to, to take on uh, the, the greater challenges that have been put out in front of us. Uh, we started with uh, our mobile crisis outreach teams and one team, as, as the county executive said, we've now expanded that to three teams and expect to expand that even more coming this year, thanks to uh, guidance and direction from the county executive and support from county council. Uh, we know that people have been calling in looking for help and support. So we've expanded the, the mobile, uh, our, our, our hotline capacity, uh, text and chat capacity. We've had uh, uh, a fair amount of capacity, but we're growing that because we know there's, there's going to be some need. Uh, and we are working with, uh, with uh, the police department and fire and rescue uh, and the community to implement the changes that are called for as part of the Reimagining Public Safety Initiative that's been going on uh, for the last year since the county executive took office. Uh, beyond the mental health pieces that I just talked about, Health and Human Services is also continuing to support people who are in need. The emergency rental assistance income, food support, cash assistance, and follow up on health care needs for folks who have who've been exposed to COVID. All part of the collaborative that is uh, um, in close partnership with our minority health programs, uh, Salute Being a Star, the African American Health Program, and uh, the Asian American Pacific Islander uh, Health Programs all working to try to bring vaccination, um, testing, case management, and other resources to, to people uh, who may not be able to, to, uh, to, um, to access those services regularly and whose need has increased in, in, during the pandemic. We're continuing in this, this budget year to, to uh, support consolidated service hubs um, that have played such a vital role this year in getting food and resources to those who, who are in need, but also uh, now um, making sure that there is a connection to human services and other social support needs. For those folks who may not be able to access online services easily, uh, they can get a person who's getting in-person help um, near where they live. So they don't have to travel as far and they don't have to worry about trying to get online. We'll, we'll be there to help and, and make sure they, get, they have the access. We are increasing uh, in, this, in, this, in this coming year mobile human or adding mobile health and human services uh, supports to areas in the county where traditionally uh, services are limited. So up county uh, in the Ag Preserve and, and, and such, we'll be moving around to make sure that people have an opportunity to get access to, to human services. Um, those last few things don't sound like mental health services, but addressing these underlying issues is how we limit the mental health impacts on people as they come out of, of uh, of this pandemic, as we come out of this pandemic, and how we support their recovery. The, the good news uh, beyond that, what I just shared with you, uh, is that while we're planning for the year ahead, there is help available now. Our crisis center uh, and hotlines are still open 24-7, 365 days a year. Our mobile crisis team is active and up and running. Um, there are a variety of providers who have been open throughout the year, largely on telehealth, but they're coming back into the offices. They will also remain on telehealth, uh, so uh, continue providing telehealth services so people can still reach out to them um, by phone and online as needed. So what can people do for themselves uh, and, and others to help themselves and others as we, as we go through this transition of, of, of from being really shut down to being fully open and, and back to life as normal? Um, if there's an urgent need and there's an urgent sense of stress, call for help now. Don't delay, don't wait on it. Just pick up the phone and call. There's help available. Talk to your children, your partners, your older family members about their concerns and worries. And listen, it is not a, um, 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 shouldn't be expected that people just ma automatically manage this. There may be some stress and some things that people aren't saying and aren't sharing. So we have to spend some time getting to know, paying attention to that. Uh, check in with friends and neighbors to see how they're doing as well. In yourselves, you have to expect some anxiety and stress uh, and in others. Give yourself some time to adjust and, and be patient with yourselves and others. The county executive mentioned earlier and, and, and some of my staff have come back and reported their experiences of encounters in public settings with people who are wearing masks and people who are not wearing masks. Um, we're all trying to adjust to this and so it's important to be patient and to be a little bit more tolerant. Um, take small steps. Uh, and, and, and if you're feeling anxious about it, you know, face to face with one or two family members or friends to, to get a feel for it and, and to find your way. Um, moving to outdoor events instead of indoor events as a, as a, first, first, as a first step. 
if panic or feelings of anxiety or panic persist, it's important to talk to someone, talk to your doctor, talk to a mental health professional. It may be that you're dealing with something that's more complex than just simple anxiety. You may be facing panic attacks. You may have some complex grief. There may be some trauma associated with, with, with COVID for you that, that it's important for you to, to, to get help and, and work through it. Talking to someone uh, doesn't mean that you have a mental illness. It doesn't mean that you're crazy. Uh, it just means that you want to have a chance to, 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 to use someone as a sounding board. Um, none of us have had to deal with this, with, with where we are, and we are all dealing with it at the same time. So don't hesitate to call for yourself, uh, your friend or your family members, uh, your friends or your family members. I want to add my, uh, take a minute and add, add my thanks to Dr. Gales and, and his team over in public health for the work. Uh, along with the hundreds of staff um, in, in the HHS public health space, but also in aging and disabilities, and behavioral health, and all of the spaces that have helped throughout this process to make it, to, to make, uh, to get us to this point. And I want to add uh, my thanks to, to regional service center directors and, and the Office of Community Partnership and the hundreds of volunteers who every weekend spend time and energy to, to try to keep us safe. So. I will stop there and, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kroll. So let's get started with the Q&A portion of this presentation. First questions are coming from Kate Ryan, WTOP, for the County Executive and also for Dr. Gale. Kate. Kate Ryan. Yes, thank you. Ah. There you are. Um, okay, I had a question about a library staffing. Uh, once we hit the 28th, again, are, are you 100% at libraries? Or it, do people still have to mask and socially distance? And if so, is that tied to the fact that you have activities for young children at libraries? What's the difference there? Who would like to take that question? I was going to let Mark take it, but if, if I'm happy to. So, uh, on the 20, so we will continue our um, the county. The county will continue our county facilities. The masking policy in, indoors, largely because we're providing services to a, a huge array of different people, uh, children, uh, frail, uh, underlying health conditions, all those things. Uh, we also obviously are bringing back a number of employees who, you know, we have to we have to engender confidence within our county staff as well as we get them back to the workplace. Uh, I don't know how long that policy will remain in place. We're continuing to evaluate that as we see our numbers continue to dip. And so it's entirely plausible that that policy will not last long in over the next several weeks or months. We're going to continue to evaluate that. Um, but um, that, that is the case. Now, as it relates to libraries specifically, uh, obviously we have um, the six that are opening the first week of June. There are another six that are planned to open by the middle of June, and then the rest will open by uh, early July, I believe it is, is the current timeline. Uh, I, I believe the libraries is still continuing to look at that timeline and, and could accelerate those based on uh, success in this first phase of reopening. Obviously, we do have about, I believe, 15 to 20 percent uh, staff vacancies that are in the process of being hired back at the county executive's direction. And so obviously some of the later openings will be based on the ability to refill those 15% of positions that were just not filled during the pandemic because we wanted to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Uh, that's as much as I have on that, Kate, but I don't know if the county executive or anyone else has anything they'd like to add. Okay, if, if I can follow up, you, you um, mentioned um, uh, vaccination in uh, pockets of the county, the continued uh, working with particular groups. And again, I, I believe you mentioned, I think it was the post story on um, in DC, the number of the rate of uh, uh, COVID in um, black residents here and tied to not being vaccinated. Is there again, a, a continuing either hesitancy or just, uh, lack of vaccinations among that population and have you been able to nail down precisely what that is what's at the root of it dr gales yeah go ahead dr gales where do you have dr stoddard uh well I, I think it's it's a broader question across the board um i think that the collective efforts of, of the county apparatus 
uh, working very closely with community partners. Uh, Dr. Corbel mentioned uh, the Salud EBN STAR initiative, as well as the African American Health Program and our Asian, uh, Asian American Health Initiative. Their efforts in terms of getting uh, good penetration through education and outreach to different communities, as well as physically standing up uh, uh, vaccine clinics that are uh, approximate to those priority zip codes that have been highlighted that have been disproportionately impacted the most. Uh, and so it's been a continuum of, of all of those collective efforts uh, working to uh, increase uh, the percentage of folks getting covered. Now, I don't have the specific breakdown by race uh, in terms of our new cases, but as the county executive mentioned in his opening comments, we're talking about, now granted, one case is too many, but we're talking about now in the last couple of days, we've seen 12, 14, 15 cases on a daily basis. So the number continues to shrink as those efforts that I referenced continue to ramp up uh, to highlight and make sure that those key areas um, do have opportunities to get vaccinated. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, as you know, we've been working with uh, FEMA to place a strike team. They've been providing vaccinations at different sites throughout the county. Again, influenced by those areas that have been, the, been hit the hardest. Uh, we did see some lower vaccine percentage uptake in the northern part of the county. And we are, we're not ready to announce exact dates, but we, we've been working with uh, one of the large retail entities in the northern part of the county to set up uh, a vaccine site again to increase access points throughout the county uh, to increase those percentages. And so I just add, like I've I've been to a number of vaccine sites and talked with some of our workers, and you know they find themselves often in conversation with people who've either come but aren't sure if they're going to take the final step to either get in line or to stay in line. Yeah. And they talk a lot about just, just people have just been given amazing misinformation. Um, there are people still talking about chips. There are still people talking about, are we going to take their DNA? I mean, are they going to be sterile? I mean, the amount of nonsense that has proliferated out there and has gotten to people, um, it, it has made this more challenging than ever, which is why we're doing, you know, continuing to do deep work in communities because we can't afford to have people be misinformed. We can't afford to have people remain vulnerable. We know this thing will not totally go away. And so as well as the rest of us get, and as many of the rest of us get vaccinated, having a large number of unvaccinated people is, is gonna be a problem for them. And ultimately a problem for them is a problem for everybody. So we're, we're taking this part really seriously. You don't see us letting up in our effort to get vaccines out in the community for that reason. Oh, yeah, just, just, yeah, just one thing to add to that, a couple of things to add to that. One of them is that throughout this process, as we introduced a, an equity framework and for, for tracking and addressing the, the gap between um, the larger county and, and, and African, black and African and Latino communities, we noticed there was, there was consistently with each wave, each group that we opened up, there was a lag um, in, in, uh, in, the, in the black and brown communities that we, that our efforts to communicate and engage helped us to close in each state. That was true for the uh, 65 and older population. It's been true for the younger adult population. And as we used, moved into 12 to 15, we think we're seeing a similar kind of thing, an initial gap that gets rapidly closed. So we're, we're, we're hoping that that, that will, expecting that that will continue across the board. Uh, we do know, and we've always known, that as we got farther and farther into vaccinations and higher percentages of people vaccinated, that this was going to get harder and that we were going to have to take vaccines closer and closer into communities, which is what we're doing now. That, that uh, while we've got large sites, we're also now looking at how do we move into the communities to vaccinate in those, those communities that, are, um, that have not, that are under vaccinated in, our, in, in, in the county. And that's not... I'm not ready to talk about hesitancy in this, in, this, in this framework because I don't know what's in the minds of the people who haven't gotten vaccinated yet. Some of them, to, as county executive talks about, are, came and said, well, maybe, maybe no. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Some of them have been busy working and it, hadn't, it hasn't been convenient and in a location. And some of them, quite honestly, hadn't been able to sign up online for it. So we're having our outreach team go door to door to do those knocks on doors and, and uh, our, our, our partners in the community to sign people up and to host events so that we're getting 
it into places where where we have uh, where we're seeing the, the lag. It, it's um, we knew this was going to be a challenge, and this is the point where the challenge begins. So, and we'll continue to try to understand what what the hesitancy is, and our comms teams and and community partners will help us to make to develop messages that get people's attention and work and, and to pull people into the side of getting vaccinated. Gotcha. I did want to follow up with one thing, um, Dr. Coral, you mentioned earlier, anxiety before, I think pre-pandemic, 13% of the population, now you're seeing it in 14%. When you say the population, uh, of, of what, where does that number come from? Forgive me, I, I'm not clear. So Kaiser, so Kaiser did a research study on this, has been tracking anxiety and, and other kinds of things over the course of the year. And they looked back uh, as, the, as of uh, a year ago at the start of the pandemic, those numbers were in the 13, 14% range of people who were expressing some form of anxiety. As of January, end of January this year, they looked at that number again, and it was 40% of the people that they surveyed and interviewed who were expressing some, some levels of, of anxiety um, in, in, the, in the general public. Got it. And again, that's a national survey, correct? That's right. That's right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Kate. Um, we have a follow-up question on anxiety about the county's efforts to alleviate anxiety, and it comes from Tim Carney, Washington Examiner. Tim. Uh, thank you. I want to ask about if you guys have been to the store, you've noticed almost everybody at Giant or Home Depot or places that don't require masks, almost everybody, at least down county and mid county is wearing masks. And so I've surveyed people in Montgomery County and the number one answer is, I'm not confident that the guy next to me in line actually is vaccinated. So these are vaccinated people who have what I understand to be a misperception of how their vaccine works. So I wonder if, if there's a way to communicate hey, your vaccine protects you even from unvaccinated people, if that could help other people get vaccinated to see that it provides robust protection regardless of what other people do. And if it's maybe a good idea for, you know, county leaders like Mr. Elridge, Dr. Gale to show up at Home Depot maskless and say, I can do this because I got a vaccine and science proves that it works. How are we enhancing vaccine confidence even among the vaccinated? So I think we message people continuously about the effectiveness of the vaccine. And as we know more and learn more about it, we, we share that messaging on a, on a regular basis um, through you all and through our media briefings and in the town halls and to our outreach workers, uh, that messaging kind of continuously goes out. Uh, we're all in the, in the, in the, in the space of, uh, look, for a year and for 14 months now, we have told people, put your mask on, keep your social distance from each other, um, stay safe and protected from each other. Uh, and now we have, in the space of a month, started to change that. It's, it's early to expect people to drop masks and go full pell-mell back into close social proximity, especially with people that they're not familiar with and don't know yet. Um, the vaccine is incredibly effective. Uh, uh, and I think Dr. Stoddard has, some, has some, um, some, some information around that in terms of just that he shared with us about a level of effectiveness relative to the flu vaccine. Um, but it is... It is the case that people have to, we have to give people time to adjust to, to, to get back into those public spaces. I'm not ready yet to go back in tours in, into a restaurant and in, to have an indoor dining event in a restaurant yet. Um, you're right, I don't know when someone takes off their mask who's vaccinated or who's not vaccinated. Um, and that's just part of this transition that we're gonna be in. Um, the vaccine is safe and effective. Um, doesn't mean that it's 100% because nothing is. Uh, and so we have to now watch and, and, and move very carefully as individuals around this as we work our way through this. Yeah, uh, thanks for your question, Tim. Uh, I, I uh, Yesterday was my wife and my wife and I's 13th anniversary. We went out and dined indoors yesterday. Uh, so um, I, I definitely, it was the first time I've dined indoors in 14 months. Uh, and so just for context, and so um, I think it's just important that we, I mean, everyone's going to come along through this through a process. There's going to be, there's going to be a process here. And I think everyone's going through this. Some, some people are more further along in the process than other people are. And I think um, it's going to take some time as we, as we get confidence with uh, people in businesses, the businesses themselves, because I think the businesses themselves are a little bit afraid too, that, you know, in Montgomery County being, um, you know, uh, being the way, the way we've been restricted before, they're concerned that their, their own clientele may not come to them if they, 
uh, remove uh, face covering requirements too. And so we're trying to, it's a, it's a balance of trying to give people the information that yes, if you are vaccinated, if you're vaccinated for COVID-19, you've gotten both doses, you've waited that requisite 14 days after you got in your second dose, the risk of COVID-19 to you is lower than the risk of the flu is on any, in any given season. So I think it's important to understand, like that is a baseline fact of the science. And so you can be comfortable doing things indoors, being vaccinated without a face covering if you, if you choose, you know, but, but it's also like we have to be comfortable without people. We know that people, you know, I, I have unvaccinated children. I, I still probably wouldn't take my unvaccinated children into an indoor signing, dining setting yet. Uh, but people are going to come along at different time periods. Vaccination is a great protection for them, but we've got to bring people along to that building confidence, you know, not just public, our county employees, uh, visitors across the board. We've got to build people up to that. And I, I think that your point is well taken that we've got to, so, you know, we're going to, have to show more leadership over time and get people more comfortable, more comfortable, more comfortable. Um, I don't think it's going to be one of those things where people are going to again, these wake up tomorrow and be like, you know what, pandemic's over. I'm, I'm going to go back to my life as normal. It's going to be a transition process. And the, the last thing I would say to that is on this is, is that, you know, to be quite honest, the last two times I went to the grocery store, I didn't even notice. I'm so accustomed to seeing masks are required in this facility, I didn't even look to see what the signage is now said or whether the signage is now signed. I just reflexively, somewhere between my car and the front door of the grocery store, my mask goes on. Um, and so, and once it's on, you know, I just leave it on. Um, so it's, it's, it's gonna take some time for everybody to, to, to make those, to change those reflexes back. Look, I'll, I'll just say, look, I don't think wearing a mask is a bad thing. And I don't feel like my freedoms have been impinged upon. I have no loss of my human rights. It's not a big deal. So if people feel comfortable, more comfortable wearing a mask, it's not a problem. It's probably not bad because, you know, depending where this virus goes and what, if there is a second round or whatever, um, you may have to you reintroduce some of these ideas again. And if you have to, it would be good if people just kind of saw it as, you know, I can go about my life. I would frankly like to see the stores filled with people on masks and get them used to coming back to stores and restaurants, whether they wear a mask or not. Because what the, you know, what the person selling the goods in the store cares about is somebody here in here buying my stuff. And if people are comfortable going back in, this is a good thing. And if they wear a mask, that's fine. And, and I think, you know, all of us are affected by things like, you know, how many New York Yankees staff got COVID after they had been vaccinated. It was like nine, not a small number. And I know people, I actually know a couple that at post-vaccination got mild cases of COVID because they were exposed to somebody and were in a, in, a, in a dwelling unit with somebody for a couple of days who had COVID. So, you know, it does happen, it's possible. I'd rather have people be safe, but I really want, I do think that that this is safe enough now for people to start going back. I've eaten outdoors. I've eaten indoors. Um, I haven't worried about eating indoors. Uh, I, you know, been to a number of retailers. I won't advertise them, but uh, I go to retail stores like everybody else does. And I, I do wear a mask when I go in. So thank you. But because those cases that you're talking about post-vaccination are mild, and from if I'm piecing together correctly, all these comments. Yeah. The continued masking is about alleviating anxiety and making people comfortable. It's not really about protecting people from serious illness or further transmission, or am I overstating that? Not, you're not protecting vaccinated people, but it is protecting unvaccinated people, and that's the problem. If you, t if you say masks off and nobody even bothered to wear them anymore, unvaccinated people are a threat to spread it and they are the most likely to get it. And if you don't know who's vaccinated and, who, and who's not, it, it is a real problem. I mean, it's, it's not like we're at 70 or 80%. If we, were, if we had 80% of the population and that would leave out what the zero to 12 year olds, um, I'd probably feel pretty good about everything, but we still have you know, a bunch of people who aren't vaccinated at all. And Montgomery County is doing well. There are parts of the state where numbers aren't anywhere close to ours. So I don't want to, I, I wouldn't want to send out a message that you should just not wear a mask because a whole bunch of people will drop their mask if they're not vaccinated because they know we're not requiring them to prove they're vaccinated. 
I just like, we just, we'll all survive masks, whether we choose to wear them or not at this point, we will survive. And, uh, and it'll, this will get better. Be patient. Look what we put up with for the last 15 months. Thank you, Tim. The next question comes from Steve Bonnell, the best of beat, and questions actually for the county executive and the other presenters. Steve. Afternoon, everybody. This is probably mostly for the executive, but other health officials can weigh in kind of on recommendations and whatnot. Uh, you guys all kind of allude to when we reopen completely on Friday that it's not going to be a light switch, for lack of a better phrase. Um, I'm wondering what you've heard executive about kind of these larger venues, banquet halls, convention centers, you know, things where you're still going to have large gatherings in a pre-COVID, you know, society. Um, and what, I'm, I'm sure that's not going to be like a light switch. So I'm just wondering what you're hearing from those venues. And then I guess if there's any steps or recommendations the health department is taking on those specific areas, if that makes sense. Um. You know, I've been in, I've been in one large venue, fairly large venue, and they seem to have a pretty good attendance, but also a lot of people uh, wearing masks inside. Um, I, but I haven't heard from you know. I went to a ball game, but you know they only had yeah. like twenty percent seating, and all the seats were tied off. Uh, yeah. so I haven't done any of these things since then. I'll see what happens when I go to a ball game next week or so, and how many people are actually yeah. sitting next yeah. to each other. Yeah, what we're hearing from some of our economic groups is that they're, they're, they're really excited to be getting back open and operating. I think that's the initial feeling everyone across the board, like, like we're, we're approaching, you know, some milestones in terms of being like, you know, being aligned with the state, being able to fully open many activities, the, the, you know, the large venues as you've alluded to, um, and they are getting reservations, um, from across the board, even, you know, my experience in looking at with, with those groups, looking at the, the data, looking at what, ha you know, my anecdote of being out and about and in businesses, indoor dining, all those things over the last wow. several weeks, they're not back to anywhere close to 100% uh, of free COVID conditions. And I think that we recognize that. And so one of the things we are doing as part of our economic revitalization group is to really look at some of the data about foot traffic around these, the, you know, the hospitality venues, restaurants, things like that, retail, trying to understand exactly what, what, post COVID, you know, what the, we're like, we said, we're in a transition phase and you alluded to this. It's not gonna be a light switch. It's not gonna be a light switch for people coming, but wanting to come back into these venues as well. And so we've got to understand uh, what, where we are seeing those differentials in, in, in pre versus, you know, post, post COVID. I use that in really air quotes because we're not really post COVID. We're just sort of transitioning away from some of the more restricted measures. We have to understand which areas we need to focus more messaging in so people become more comfortable. We probably need to focus on those areas and, you know, looking at, you know, are there needs for additional uh, relief or alleviation of, of, of requirements or, or some things to help those businesses out in this transition phase. But we're trying to be a lot more intentional about collecting data and understanding exactly what's happening in these venues uh, as opposed to, you know, during the, the midst of the pandemic, really just using a shotgun approach to try and get dollars out to people who needed it. Now we really need to understand what, 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 is, what does after COVID economy look like and how can we get some information that tells us how we can help the businesses recover in those sectors as well. Just a follow up to that, I, forgive me because I've just started here in Bethesda, but um, one of the things up in Frederick that they've done, the health department is, you know, if you're going to have a large gathering at a certain venue of, I think it was over 100 people, that you're required to notify the health officer a week in advance or a couple of weeks in advance. Do we have anything similar to that down here, even if we reopen Friday, or is that um, that can be for any help people? Well, we've had a process. Thank you, Steve, and welcome to the county, um, to Bethesda. Uh, we've had a process where we have up until actually, as I mentioned earlier, we've had a, a policy review uh, committee that has reviewed and provided input to uh, any events that would go outside of the capacity limits and restrictions that were in place. We don't currently um, have in place something uh, that you that you have referenced that would start after Friday. Um, however, you know we've been very open with any of our businesses or folks having events if they you know would 
would like clarification or input in terms of how to make sure that their events are as safe as possible, you know, we've, we've been open about being able to provide that additional resource. You good, Steve? Uh, last one for the executive. Uh, this is more of a budget question. Um, just obviously, this has been a very unique budget year. Um, this obviously was getting going during the last budget cycle, but just uh, wanted you to reflect, you know, this is kind of a full cycle of you having to deal with all this while, you know, drafting a $6 billion budget. So just kind of, if you could reflect on that, that'd be, that'd be interesting. Just to hear your thoughts would be interesting. So like, I've had some practice in dealing with unusual budgets. The, the first, you know, the, the first day I took office in December of 2018, the next day they called me into a meeting to explain that uh, that budget projections for that year were off by something. I feel it was $40 million or $60 million that the revenues were off and that I had this giant shortfall that I had to cut services for the rest of that year. That was my beginning here. And we put together a budget with based on reduced revenues and about two weeks before we submitted the budget, the state sent out a bulletin saying you have to write down your revenues another 40 million dollars for the following year which meant we had to go back and do our budget again that was my introduction to montgomery county budgeting two major cuts in available resources within the first six months of being here uh, the second year when i introduced my budget the day we introduced it i think the governor announces <laughs> that we're in COVID emergency and the council decides that they're not actually going to evaluate the budget or look at the budget. We're going to basically do a same services budget um, from the year before. So none of the things we wanted to do or tried to do in the last year's budget, we, we were actually able to implement because we weren't going to go through the budget that way. And this year is a budget where we're able to, you know, fund most things, but knowing that a lot of that help has come from the federal government, uh, which has helped us do the things that we that we're expected to do, which makes it a little less than a totally normal budget, but we're reasonably optimistic. I think, um, you know, it's it's been it's been challenging for three budgets to never have a totally normal circumstance to provide a budget in. But um, I think this this budget comes out really well. It touches major things that we were trying to do, um, the commitments. Um, that, you know, we've been trying to live up to, you know, are, are embedded in this budget. I will say, you know, you weren't here, but when I was running for office, I told people, I said, Montgomery County is going to run out of money because I knew what was going on with property taxes. And I was pretty sure we were in trouble. I said, we're going to have to change the property tax system, which voters did in this last election. But I also said that I'm, and because of that, I can't promise very much. I was going to focus investments on schools and on early childhood education and on developing a transportation system and plus the efforts we would make with the environment. And this is where, you know, we've kind of put the money. I've got $5 million more in for child care. I dealt with the homeless crisis and spent $15 million um, providing a building for that. Um, we, you know, We've accelerated the BRT progress. The money this year will move things forward quicker than it had been moving forward before. So I've been able to do kind of what I laid out I wanted to do. But like I said, I understood in getting elected that this county did not have the resources it needed to do everything that we wanted. And we focused on what we could do, and that's what this budget reflects. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Mr. CAO, Madalena, would you like to add anything budget related since we're on that subject? No, we're good to go. Uh, that was the last question on the chat. Reporters, going once, going twice. I think we're done for today. Thank you everybody for joining us. Stay safe and we'll see you next time. Good afternoon. <laughs>